Hi everyone, welcome to our last but not least session, Open Contracting, a new frontier from, for transparency and accountability. In this session, we have two speakers, Bernadine Ferns from Open Contracting Partnership and Liu Yaozhong from the Agency Against Corruption, Ministry of Justice, Taiwan. The first up is Bernadine. Uh, she is the global head of infrastructure and regional head of Asia Pacific at the Open Contracting Partnership. Before joining OCP, she was associate director and regional manager for Latin America and Southeast Asia at COST, C -O -S -T, the Infrastructure Transparency Initiative. And prior to joining COST, she had a lot of working experience on mega infrastructure projects. Let's welcome Ben. Ben, the floor is yours. Hi, thanks, DK. Great to be here. Can you hear me okay? Great, super. Hi. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks, DK, for that introduction. It's great to be here. Thank you also for inviting me uh, for this important event. So as some of you may already know, the Open Contracting Partnership, or OCP, has been um, uh, collaborating with the government of Taiwan for some time now. We were proud partners on the presidential hackathon um, events uh, going back to 2019 and 2020, where we supported the design and delivery of the hackathons. And this year, I was also a judge uh, on the international track. So I'm really excited to be here, um, really looking forward to um, the important advances in open government that Taiwan is making and really looking forward to how OCP is an organization and our broader global community can help to support um, these uh, exciting and timely commitments that have been made. So today, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about how open contracting fits into the OGP realm. And then I will uh, obviously explain what open contracting actually is and talk you through uh, a quick start guide of how to implement open contracting and how to use it to help deliver some of your open government partnership uh, or OGP goals in your NAP. So I'm going to share my screen and let me know if you can see it. So here we are, hopefully you can uh, see my screen. Um, if you can't, please do shout. Um, so first up, uh, let's talk a little bit about how open contracting um, sits within the OGP realm. So many of you may know that open contracting is a global norm. It's been endorsed by the G70, uh, the G7, the G20, the OECD, uh, many other international standard setting institutions. Um, and of course, it complements um, sister initiatives like the Beneficial Ownership Data Standards, EITI, Cost Infrastructure Transparency Initiative, and, and many others. Um, but of course, in today's context, the most important thing of all is that open contracting is one of the most common policy areas for um, OGP commitments. So in this next slide, you'll see that as of March 2019, almost 190 open contracting commitments have been made in OGP national action plans. Over 70 OGP members, that's almost three quarters of all the members, have made at least one commitment uh, to open contracting. And this includes Australia, Canada, France, the UK, uh, the US, at the subnational level, Scotland, um, and, and various others. And over 50% of these uh, currently have active um, open contracting commitments. And 55% uh, of these commitments have also been substantially completed. And this is important because um, you'll know that in the open government um, process, you know, they have um, some very stringent uh, mechanisms for measuring how effective these commitments are. And increasingly, by and large, open contracting is used as a tool um, to deliver effective commitments. So you'll see in the slide that over 40% of open contracting commitments are also uh, delivering um, significant improvements to transparency. So they've uh, dramatically opened up government. And this is more than double the, the rate of successful commitments overall. So um, it's certainly a tool that has been uh, very helpful in the open government um, realm. So the question is, what is open contracting and, and who is the open contracting partnership? So open contracting partnership or OCP, we work with governments, with businesses, uh, with civil society, 
to help transform public procurement to deliver better goods, services and public works for everyone. And open contracting is about publishing and using open, accessible, timely information on government contracting to engage citizens, businesses and all relevant stakeholders to identify and fix problems. And using the power of open data and using effective participatory mechanisms, open contracting can help to reduce corruption, improve competition, drive better value for money, um, build credibility and trust. Um, and, and now we're even pushing the boundaries and going uh, more broader into um, social and environmental equity issues as well. And I'll talk about this uh, a little bit more later on. So you might ask, why is this important? Um, so here is some, some context. So every year, governments spend a huge amount of money on public procurement um, from everything uh, from pens to paper to uh, airports and roads and major infrastructure projects. And this global spending amounts to $13 trillion um, every year. That's a, a massive percentage of global GDP and approximately one out of every $3 that's spent by governments is spent on public contracts. But we also know that procurement is government number one corruption risk. We know that almost 60% of foreign bribery cases prosecuted under the OCD involve um, bribes for public contracts. We know that over 30% of companies tell us that corruption prevented them from winning contracts uh, in the EU. And COVID has exacerbated these challenges. Um, crisis situations we know are ripe for corruption. And this is due in part to the soaring funding levels. Uh, we know that in the first four months of the pandemic alone, government spent over $100 billion on COVID contracts. And, and that's just in the first four months. Um, it's also due to reduced financial controls. There are supplies of new actors or changing actors entering uh, the market. And so these low levels of transparency, this lack of digitization, this uh, poor coordination have created a, a kind of hunger games, if you like, uh, where hospitals, health authorities, um, national local governments all scramble to compete to purchase the medicines, equipment um, and services that they so desperately need. And as a result of this, we've seen um, millions and millions of dollars that have been squandered on questionable purchases. Um, in the last two years, we've seen ventilators that never arrived. Uh, for example, in Israel, we've seen counterfeit masks and um, test tubes that turned out to be nothing more than mini soda bottles and that were unfit for use both in the US. And we've even seen a, a case, a striking case in um, Bosnia where Raspberry Farm won a $6 million contract to supply ventilators. And uh, I'm sure many of us will have questions about whether or not we'd want to uh, use ventilators that uh, were supplied by a Raspberry Farm where they may not necessarily have the expertise um, to procure this type of uh, equipment. So all this comes down to thinking about how we need to close these gaps, how we need to squeeze these inefficiencies so that we can transform public procurement for the better. And it's also worth mentioning that it's not always corruption. It can just as often be incompetence. And this is an example of what can happen when uh, project planning and coordination breaks down. So this is a real photograph um, of a public project in Lithuania. It's uh, it's in a school. You can see immediately that there's some problems here. There are no stalls, there are no cubicles, there are no doors, there are no sinks. And most important of all, it was meant to be a girl's changing room. So I think this has helped to set the, the context for, you know, what are some of the deficiencies in public procurement and public spending? And the question is, what can we do about it? And this is where open contracting can help. So you'll see in the slide a QR code on the top left hand corner, and that'll take you to our quick start guide to open contracting. You don't have to look at it now, but you can save it for future reference um, if that's helpful. But in the next bit of my presentation, I'm going to talk about the four foundations of open contracting. And I'll share with you also some examples of successful implementation uh, from around the world. So first up on our journey, we need to think about how to set reform goals um, for open government and for open contracting. And this means identifying what is the problem that you want to solve and what is the change or the impact that you're trying to achieve. And if you're clear about your objectives, it becomes easier to understand 
the route to success. And in the next two slides, I'm going to talk a little bit about how um, some open and contracting implementers have gone about this. Uh, this is one of my favorite examples. This is uh, an example from Colombia, where the government wanted to improve the way school meals were being procured and delivered in, in, in Bogota. It was common knowledge at the time that the procurement of school meals were inefficient, prices were inflated. And basically what was happening was that suppliers were colluding to fix prices so that prices uh, remained high. So for example, uh, chicken drumsticks were being procured at four or five times the market price, sometimes as much as uh, 20 American dollars per drumstick. And well, I don't know about you, but I don't feel good about paying $20 uh, for a chicken drumstick. But on top of that, many school meals that had already been paid for were also not being delivered. So children were going hungry. Now, one of the reasons that uh, suppliers could behave in this way was because the way school meals were tended uh, prevented many suppliers from participating in these um, uh, public contracts. So the tenders grouped together not just the, the producing of food, but also the distribution of food. So it meant that suppliers had to uh, you know, come up with the fruit and vegetables, whatever it is, apples, pears, bananas, but also deliver it across the school network. Now, many of the smaller suppliers could only do one or the other. They couldn't do both because they just didn't have you know, that type of capacity. So with the open contracting approach, you know, these deficiencies were able to be identified. And as a result, the government unbundled those contracts so that suppliers could do either one or the other. So you come up with the sandwiches or the apples and pears, or you deliver it across the school network. And also uh, they enabled a um, matchmaking scheme so that companies could also partner together um, to bid for contracts. And as a result of that, we've seen some dramatic improvements. Supply diversity increased by over 350%. Um, costs uh, went down. And more importantly, over 800,000 school meals were being delivered to hungry children uh, all across the city. And then this next example, um, it's uh, one of uh, a very recent one from Buenos Aires. So here, the city government of Buenos Aires set out to improve efficiency in the way that infrastructure uh, projects were planned, uh, procured and delivered, and they also had a goal to improve uh, public trust, which had broken down. Now, what was happening in the city government, um, as in many governments, often you'll find that um, there's a lot of fragmentation uh, across agencies, a lot of silos across agencies where different systems are being used uh, by different agencies and different um, multiple different platforms uh, in different data formats. So it makes it really difficult for them to talk to each other. It makes it difficult for them to coordinate. And uh, it also meant that uh, this then causes um, some significant inefficiencies. So for example, um, public officials had to uh, repeatedly request uh, the same information from the same people, you know, all different agencies asking for the same information over and over again. And often it could take any anywhere from two weeks to two months, um, you know, for officers to provide this information. So obviously uh, this um, was not ideal and citizens were also frustrated because they faced constant disruptions uh, from public construction work and there was no visibility as to what was happening or why and so trust had broken down. So as a result of this, the city government introduced a platform called the Obras, uh, which was an in information um, transparency platform for infrastructure um, to help address some of these um, deficiencies. And they joined up key information and infrastructure projects and made it freely accessible to everyone. So officials no longer had to go through that complicated and lengthy process to request information, wait for it to be processed and sent to them. And similarly, citizens also um, had information they needed at their fingertips. And so we've seen, again, dramatic improvements from this work. Um, you'll see on this slide that uh, there was a 93% reduction in time for government to collect and share data. Journalists uh, was also telling us that they spent less time on research, 75% less in fact. Um, Governments uh, reported that uh, they've seen better coordination, so they were better able to uh, join up uh, their efforts, not just for infrastructure uh, planning and delivery, but also for other related um, government uh, initiatives, such as sort of equity initiatives or social welfare initiatives. Uh, and it also improved the supervision of infrastructure projects going all the way right to the top, uh, which was useful. 
And finally, um, we've also seen that citizen complaints uh, have uh, dramatically reduced and businesses are also telling us that this has helped them uh, to better plan their supply chains and participate in bids. So these are some examples of how when you're clear about your reform goals, you can then uh, set out a, a plan for how to achieve it. So next up on the open contracting journey is to publish and use uh, open contracting data. So at the core of our work are two internationally recognized uh, data standards, which help stakeholders to publish and use standardized, structured, machine readable open data in a timely manner so that it's easier to understand what is working and what isn't in your public procurement uh, process. In the next slide, you'll see a schematic of what the Open Contracting Data Standard or OCDS looks like. And you'll see that it covers uh, the entire public procurement cycle from planning to bidding to award to contracts uh, to implementation. And then this next slide, you'll see the Open Contracting or Infrastructure Data Standard or OC4IDS. And you'll see here that it covers both um, the contracting level, um, the OCDS, which I just talked about, but also some project level information. And this is really important because, as we all know, that infrastructure projects uh, often involve more than one contract um, doing different things. So it's important to be able to join up contracts to the project so that you can see what's happening uh, on a project um, at a, all at once instead of just at, a, at the individual contract level. Because um, it may be the case that uh, you know, certain contracts are going well, but the project as a whole is not. And so these open data standards are the basis for building and sharing data tools um, that help you to use and analyze information. And what it means is that you can, you can build tools like this. Now, this is an example from Indonesia, where amongst other things, they built a red flags tool to help identify corruption risks. And uh, again, some of you may know that we have extensive guidance on, on how to use OCDS uh, to develop red flag indicators uh, to help identify potential corruption. And so some examples of those indicators, um, for those of you who are interested, could be, um, for example, bidders who are constantly losing. So these are fake bidders who um, join bids to create the impression of competition when in fact they have no intention of winning. Um, they could be, for example, identical pricing, uh, especially for line items, and this helps to um, indicate that there may be some collusion or some collusive agreements with different companies. Um, it could also be uh, patterns to winning and losing. So for example, you know, when companies win or lose together, if company A wins tender A and company B always wins uh, a related tender, tender B, for example. So there are lots of different indicators um, and they're all on our website. I recommend that you check it out. Um, these are some of the things that you can do. And so Indonesia Corruption Watch ha has um, you know, incorporated some of the open contracting best practice into the red flags indicators. You can see it at the bottom here, um, you know, where there's also a traffic light system, um, sort of green, yellow, and red to help indicate uh, the potential risk. Uh, they've also developed uh, three dashboards, one that covers all of national procurement, uh, one for infrastructure, and another for COVID procurements. And they, again, apply many of the um, open contracting use cases um, and use the indicators, for example, for efficiency, um, value for money, um, integrity, um, competition, etc. And then this next slide uh, is, a, is an example from Paraguay, where uh, we work with our partners there to ensure the accurate identification and publication of COVID emergency procurement, uh, which had to be published within 10 days of purchase. So there was almost real time uh, up to date um, prices um, for COVID procurement that was being published. And as a result of that, journalists have since uh, started to identify um, many irregular procurements, um, some of which were reported extensively in the media. And there was a striking example where a state-owned enterprise had uh, purchased large volumes of tonic water at five times the market price, um, purportedly because it could protect against the virus, which obviously it could not. But as a result of these investigative journalism efforts, um, the NCP, the National Procurement Agency, has introduced new rules for reference pricing, which um, means that all emergency purchases has to be published online so that everyone can check and see uh, whether they're paying a, a fair price or not. Uh, so this then leads to more agile procurement. Now, this next slide, this is uh, one of my favorite examples. It's from Taiwan. Uh, CK will, will know it really well. 
Uh, some years back, uh, researchers worked to join up public procurement data with flood data to identify areas in greatest need of uh, flood defense infrastructure. So you can already see from the slide that um, you know the, the purple bits here are, are excellent because that shows that there's lots of floods and lots of spending. Um, and then the uh, gray bits also fine because there are no floods and no no, no spending. Uh, but you can see here that there's um, you know some some discrepancies here where in the green, for example, there are only a few floods, but lots of uh, lots of spending and in the pink where there's lots of floods, but much less spending. And so this is an example of how we can um, use data to help inform decision making and to help channel um, government efforts um, to, in this case, for example, procure flood defense infrastructure. And you'll be also interested to know that this project has actually inspired um, Civic Data Lab, who is one of the presidential hackathon 2020 um, winners um, to replicate this approach in, in India. And they're going even further uh, to add in even more data sets. So looking at demographic data, vulnerability data, poverty indicators um, and uh, you know, flood impact losses so that you can get even more um, richer, richer analysis uh, from this uh, from, from this work. Now, finally, in this section, I want to touch very quickly on um, this tool from Honduras. Again, um, one of the projects that came out as the top two teams in the presidential hackathon for 2019, uh, where they joined up infrastructure planning and procurement data with environmental data to help government planners um, more accurately assess if proposed infrastructure projects um, had negative environmental impacts and also had complied with the uh, environmental licensing requirements uh, before projects are approved. So this has a kind of a preventative um, angle to it as well. Um, so you'll see in this, um, in this slide, in this map, for example, you could see um, approved infrastructure projects with their corresponding environmental licenses or lack of. You could see discrepancies um, between approved projects and the environmental regulation requirements. Um, you can also see approved projects that uh, didn't have environmental impact assessments or failed to disclose their EIAs. So here again, you can see that data and data analytics can really help to improve decision making and drive positive change in, in multiple different ways. So if you set your reform goals and if you use that data in a meaningful way, uh, you can start to get some really exciting results. Now, next up in the open contracting journey is um, stakeholder engagement and participation. So, for example, you can do this by engaging vendors in pre-market consultations or embedding uh, some sort of monitoring process across uh, the procurement systems. So in this slide, you'll see um, this is a, a photograph of ECOBC, which is a bike share program in Mexico City. And here you'll see that the city government prioritized vendor engagement very early on in the procurement process uh, for ECOBC. And the idea was to understand how to engage the market and write RFPs that vendors will actually respond to or can actually respond to. And so this included uh, vendor forums, uh, pre-bid meetings, they've issued um, requests for information RFIs to help understand what potential innovations exist or alternative business models are out there that can help to improve the way that we're thinking about the bike share program. And they also shared data through a dedicated website and more importantly shared vendor questions and the answers to them and and how all of this was in, informing the design of the procurement process in, in relation to the bike share program and so this engagement also not only helped the government to improve the way they were thinking about um, the procurement um, the procurement process but it also gave new suppliers um, advanced notice that helped them to prepare their bids and better compete uh, in the market and this next example um, is one from Ukraine, where um, governments, businesses, civil society work together to create a world class transparent procurement system called Prozoro to help to build trust and help to improve procurement uh, in Ukraine. In the first year of operations alone, Prozoro helped to save over a billion dollars um, in cost savings. Uh, that's just from the efficiency gains alone. Thousands of new suppliers entered the market and perceptions of corruption also halved. Uh, more importantly, what I want to talk about in terms of the Ukraine process is that as part of this work, civil society monitoring was also included as part of the reforms and they built um, Dozoro. Uh, it's a platform with 
citizens, uh, civil society organizations and other stakeholders could um, use the platform to monitor contracts and report violations. They introduce um, some gamification um, aspects to this, which I really like, uh, to help incentivize monitoring. So for example, the more contracts you monitored, or if you were successful in identifying violations, you could get um, those are coins and badges, and which in turn could be traded in for um, you know, exclusive access to events, to subscriptions, uh, or merchandise. And this process was hugely successful. Um, it's um, now being replicated or we're working to replicate it in Indonesia. But in 2018, this was awarded star status um, by you know, an OGP star reform. And uh, since then, uh, the Zorro community monitors have identified violations on over 30,000 tenders. Uh, that's an estimated value of $4 billion and over 4,000 violations um, valued at uh, over $500 million have already been fixed. We know that over 40 municipalities are also using Dozoro uh, to manage the procurement pro processes, um, and over 100,000 uh, people use Dozoro on a monthly basis. So this is, I think, a great example of you know, how you can really step up stakeholder engagement and ensure a very participatory and inclusive approach. So finally, on the open contracting journey, the, the key thing to remember is that we should be constantly measuring progress um, because when you have a really good framework for doing this you can then continuously improve uh, what you're doing you can continuously refine your approach and to push for even um, better results uh, it can also help you to communicate your successes because if you know what you're achieving and what your successes are and if you have some tangible evidence for it um, you can then uh, communicate that to other stakeholders to generate even more buy-in um, for your work. So here in this last slide, I'm just gonna share very quickly an example from Integrity Action's uh, development check. Um, this is a tool that helps people to monitor infrastructure projects. And basically what they can do is that they can identify and report uh, failings or violations, and more importantly, understand what, if any action has been taken to fix those problems or complaints. And you'll see that here in these little red boxes where you see the fix rate. And so in these two examples, you'll see that the fix rate is really quite high. So we're getting to 87.5, over 90% fix rate, but there are some other projects obviously um, where the fix rate is much lower. And that's really helpful to know whether or not, you know, problems that have been identified has been, has been fixed, has been addressed, or whether it's underway. And of course, in your monitoring, evaluation, and learning plan, it doesn't have to be, um, you know, something so involved. You don't have to create, um, you know, a, a new tool or platform for it. Um, there are many different ways in which you can do it. It could be in the form of a simple spreadsheet. Um, we have many um, different templates that you can use as well. And again, they're all available on our website or through the Quick Start Guide. But it's something that you should be thinking about, uh, you know, from the start of your journey to make sure that you're capturing baselines and, and tracking progress over time. Now I'm going to close on my final slide just to share um, some key um, documents and guidance that can help you on this journey. And you'll see that again, there's a QR code here on the right, which is one of my favorite um, guidance pieces on um, you know, how to um, deliver an open contracting process for, for infrastructure. So I'm gonna close there. I'm gonna hand back um, to DK. Thank you, Ben for sharing so many very use cases of open contracting with quantifiable impact on the quality of public services and infrastructure. And especially I like your final recommendation about measure, adapt and institutionalized reforms, which is very useful since uh, a lot of countries are trying to perform evidence-based policy. I'm also happy to update you that regarding water resource management, Another thing, by integrating water flow and water quality data from layers over layers of government agencies, they had just won this year's predictive hacks on last weekend. So we are looking forward to the future synergy between these data-driven water resource governance projects and uh, hoping we can see a more and more sparks and uh, to inspire other countries more than just India. And I also like your analogy about a strawberry farm. I'm not sure if it's a true story, a selling ventilator, ventilators. Because it reminded me that a couple of years ago in Taiwan, there's a news about the airport runway pavement project was awarded to a company which had never done it before. 
Okay. So talking about which, let's hear from our next speaker, Liu Yaozhou, uh, to learn what the Agency Against Corruption has been doing to improve the integrity of the government procurement. Liu Yaozhou, the floor is yours. 大家好,我是劉耀中,我是法務部廉政署防貪署的副組長,今天很榮幸能受邀來這裡分享。Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. My name is Liu Yaozhong. I am the Deputy Director of the Corruption Prevention Division at the Agency Against Corruption of the Ministry of Justice. It is my great honor to be invited to share about government procurement integrity platform here today. 廉政署作为我国专责的廉政机构，主要的执掌是预防和打击贪腐。俗话说，预防胜于治疗。近年，我国更重视如何建立有效的机制来预防贪腐的发生，这也是联合国反贪腐公约中所强调的。而机关采购
so that the public agency no longer fight alone. We solve problems through teamwork, reduce the risk of corruption, and allow civil servants to perform professionally, make decisions bravely. 公部门的伙伴，例如廉政署、检察机关、工程会及审计单位等等，让他们可以参与案件的进行。私部门的伙伴，例如民众。厂商、公民团体等，让他们有表达意见的机会，促成机关做成符合社会公益的决策。The partners of the public sector, for example, AAC, Prosecutor's Office, Public Construction Commission, and the Audit Office, to participate in the project. Partners in the private sector include the general public. Companies and the public interest groups who have the opportunity to express their opinions. This participation in facilitating agencies to make decisions that conform to the public interest of society. 廉政平台要能够发挥效用，其中有一个很重要的关键是资讯透明，借此可以强化过程中的监督机制。所以，我们承诺事项之一就是设置廉政平台的单一入口。目前，在廉政署的中英文网站都设有廉政平台专区，从这里可以了解到廉政平台的全貌。One of the most important key to the effectiveness of an integrity platform is information transparency. Information transparency can help strengthen the supervision mechanism in the process. So one of our commitments is to set up a single entry for the integrity platform. Currently, on AAC's Chinese and English websites, there is a section dedicated to the anti-corruption platform, and from there, one can get a comprehensive picture of the platform. 所有成立廉政平台的案件都会设置专区或网页来公开案件的资讯，包括案件的基本资料，还有办理的过程、进度、会议的资料及记录、廉政伦理事件等等。我们鼓励公务机关揭露平台案件的资讯，公开的范围比我国政府采购法规定应公开的项目还要更多、更广。All information concerning the projects from the anti-corruption platform will be made publicly available on the platform section or the website, including the basic information, processes, and the progress, meeting minutes, and the related ethical events for all projects. We also encourage all government agency. To make all information regarding the platform transparent, with the information that has been made available being more extensive than what is required by the government regulations. 甚至有公开工地现场的 CCTV， 透过这样的公开，让全民参与监督，也可以增进全民的了解和信赖，减少外界质疑黑箱的机会。There are even closed-circuit televisions that open the site of the construction site. Through such openness, allowing the public to participate in supervision can also enhance the people's understanding and the trust, and reduce the outside world's questioning of the government's black box operation. 目前，全国运作中的廉政平台。既有二十九件，为了落实开放政府的承诺事项，本署未来将持续推广机关采购廉政平台，并希望能够借重四部门的力量跟经验，一起思考如何让资讯更加透明，甚至能运用机构资料的分析科技来强化防贪的措施。此外，我们也将加强行销廉政平台的成果效益。At present, there are 29 projects of anti-corruption platform in operation in Taiwan. 
in order to implement the promise of an open government, the AAC will continue to promote the procurement of an integrity platform in the future. It is hoped that by utilizing the authority and the experience from the private sector, we can improve information transparency and even employee data analysis to strengthen measures for preventing corruption. Moreover, we hope to enhance the effectiveness of the marketing of the anti-corruption platform so the world can see the effort that Taiwan has put into corruption prevention. 好，以上是廉政署介绍目前机关采购廉政平台运作的理念还有概况，敬请各位给我们意见或指教，谢谢大家。The above information demonstrates AAC's ideal and the overview of the government procurement integrity platform. Any feedback and suggestion are greatly appreciated. Thank you for your time. 可以 ，Thank you， 耀宗 ，for sharing the establishment of the the platform for integrity on government procurement. And I'm I really like the ACC's philosophy about prevention is more important than treatment. And I'm also very impressed by what you you've been saying about the extreme transparency approach for procurement projects. Especially like、uh, sharing the live streaming video cams of the, the construction projects. But however, I have a suggestion because the, the analogy, you you see a Avengers analogy. I because Avengers only activate after the fact when when the bad guy comes up. Maybe you should use the Justice League analogy more suitable for the ACC. Just a suggestion. Now we are going to take some questions from the audience. And everybody, if you have questions, you can go to Slido and、uh, type in your questions. And、uh, let me check the Slido here.、Um, okay, the first question goes to Ben. What's your suggestion for the Taiwanese government to incorporate open contracting with their anti-corruption and government procurement integrity efforts? Also, a related question somebody else asked: When can ACC apply open contracting standards for all of the 29 projects under supervision? So the first question is to Ben, and the second one is to Yao Zhong. Ben, thanks, CK.、Um, shall I start? Yes, please. Thank.、Okay. So,、um, so thanks so much for that question. It's a really great question. I love that it's action oriented.、Um, so the first thing that I can say is that an open contracting journey can start anywhere, right? I think sometimes people are daunted by it because they think that they have to overhaul everything all at the same time.、Uh, but you can start small. So I think identify the, you know, the area, the the, the program、uh, or 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 the goal that you really want to achieve and start from there. So. It could be, for example, if you have maybe some mega infrastructure projects、uh, coming up. I know that there's going to be,、um, you know, some significant、um, offshore wind farm developments in Taiwan coming up, and you might want to use that as an opportunity to pilot open contracting because one, because there's so much、um, money going into it, and because it's such a significant project that will also deliver exponential um, energy. Um, Improvements and it speaks obviously to、um, our goals for、uh, low carbon、um, world as well. You know, I think that could be like a great way to pilot the open contracting、uh, methodology and start to test it out in Taiwan and to、uh, to see you know what we can. You know what we can use and how we can refine it, and what applies in the local context.、Uh, but there may be other examples as well, right? There may be, you know, there are these 29、uh, projects, for example, on the integrity platform,、uh, which I know my esteemed colleague will speak to in 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 a in a, in a moment, where also where you can include many elements of the open contracting approach there. So I think the key is to think about what is the priority for Taiwan. What is、uh, going to be of、um, you know significance, and then from there.、Uh, 
work to to develop a plan for it and i think one final thing that i'll say in that is that the open contracting partnership with ocp is here on hand to help uh, we do a lot of co-creation work um, with our partners and very very happy to help uh, you know identify those entry points for you uh, on your open contracting journey back to you ck thank you ben yao zheng oh mm. oh what's it um mm. uh, um 这个二十九个案例哈，是我们实施廉政平台的案例，但是它并不是呃，我们并不是全国工程的主管机关，所以我们并没有还没有建立一个统一的架构跟格式出来，能够开放更多的资料。呃、uh, ，right now， even though we already have twenty nine， 呃 ，integrity platform。But because AAC is not responsible for the construction, uh, construction duty, so uh, we will push other agency to set up the integrity platform. Uh, try our best. 但是我们会继续努力。我们希望在呃四年之内，把这一个统一的架构跟格式，透过广泛的讨论，能够呃。进一步的公开出来，让大家能够知道说这一个重大工程它的采购的意义跟进度，还有它的效益有哪些？ a l t h o u g h the twenty nine projects, they disclose the information is not totally the same. Uh, some of the project maybe uh is disclose much more, and the other is not so much more information. But、uh, in the later few years, we will try to make all the disclosure information、uh, at the same standardization. Make the disclosed information are the same quality.、Uh, that that we will do. Uh, do it in the future. Uh, four years. My answer is done. Thank you. Thank you, Yao Zhong. This is a great transition to our next question from the audience. So, Ben, this is for you. So, Yao Zhong just mentioned ACC hasn't started to prepare the proper data standards to organize these twenty-nine projects. So, what is the first step for any government bodies to adopt the principle of open contracting? In ACC's case, how do they start a pilot project? Do you have any recommendation from your experience around the world? Yes, I can absolutely uh, share uh, from our implementation experience with partners. I think it's a, again a great question, and I think that Taiwan is in a really、uh, good position because you know Taiwan already has a lot of、um, sophisticated data capture. Um, solutions.、Um, you're already,、uh, you know, working with a lot of,、um, you know, standardized structured data.、Uh, there's also a lot of open data. So I think,、uh, you know, for Taiwan, that's a really good place to start because sometimes, you know, in some places where we work, we're really starting from scratch, right? Like some of you, you know, CK, you would have seen in some of、uh, my presentations. I, I often show this photograph of a, of, of a picture of, of ro a room with files, you know, from floor to ceiling, and it's just hundreds and thousands of files and rooms and rooms just. Like it,、um, and that's a you know picture of a real procurement office because they haven't yet started the digitization journey, and that makes it so much more difficult. Whereas I think in Taiwan you have the technology, you have the expertise,、um, so I think that it's、uh, the starting point for the data side is actually very very easy、um, because what we can do is then use the existing data that you're already collecting and capturing、um, and and cleaning and、uh, use that、um, you know as your starting point to publish either open contracting、uh, OCDS data, so either OCDS、uh, data or OCFIDS data. So I think that's an, a really easy win because that's you know part of the international standards that you know over sixty countries are now actively implementing, and you know we've had more obviously uh, uh, along the way. Um, the next step,、uh, and we have a, a free global help desk as well that can help you,、uh, you know, with that kind of standardization process to publish OCDS and OCFIDS. And then we also have the team at、uh, OCP to help walk you through that journey of reform. 
So I think the first thing is, um, maybe the most simple thing is to, to have a conversation with us. We're always very happy to help. Um, we can help you with the data piece and we can also help you uh, design your reform journey, um, you know, identify that pilot project and then from there work with you, um, you know, to embed, you know, some of those key elements of foundations of open contracting. So the stakeholder engagement, for example, the design process, uh, the, the MEL at the end. Um, so if, if that's helpful, I hope I answered the question. Okay. Thank you, Ben. I think it is a very clear picture to how to jumpstart a project. Our next question, let me see. Uh, next question is uh, it's for, let me just uh, turn to Yao Zhong. One of the audience asked, how effective is the government procurement integrity pro uh, platform? Can you share some, uh, you are talking about transparency, but can you share some success stories? Any real benefits? 好，非常谢谢，诶，这个提问哈，我先回应一下哈，我们很愿意跟国际上任何的关心贪腐、反贪腐的一些机构哈，来进行合作，好，呃，我们也非常的期待，就是说，呃，这些机构可以给我们台湾一个呃具体的建议，让我们在反贪腐的工作上面，怎么样能够跟国际的潮流能够接轨。Uh, thank you for the question. It's a good question. At first, we want to say we willing to cooperate with the international different organization. And uh, we really like to conversation with uh, uh, other, uh, even a country or organization. We want to uh, connect with the international trend, know how to improve our country's integrity. And the open government spirit. 嗯，接下来我来介绍一下我们廉政平台，好几个成功的案例。好，首先跟大家介绍的就是，呃，经济部的一个呃水利工程。好，它因为呃当初在准备要那个进行这个工程的时候，那呃因为这个用地啊需要跟这个民众来征收，但是民众当时。对于征收的价格，因为偏低，所以反应非常的激烈。那我们透过廉政平台找第三方的这个呃估价单位来估价了以后，哦，很顺利的让民众能够接受征收的价格。嗯、mm. ，We have one uh successful example. Uh, the example is come from the uh, the agent, the board of agent economic affairs, uh, that that project or that case is uh, the government want to take the land from the illegal occupation, and uh, because the money we we pay them is uh, uh less than the expectation, so we go through such integrity platform. Successful finish that project. 呃呃，另外一个成功的案例就是呃，在一个工程的用地上面被违法的这个砂石场所占用。我们也透过廉政平台、检察机关的协助，让这个呃这个工程用地哦，能够排除这些非法砂石场的这个占用，好，使得这个工程能够到目前为止。Another case is about a illegal gravel yard. Uh, that gravel yard is occupied by the uh, private sector. Uh, and uh, we use the integrity platform to uh, to uh, correct their action and then let the construction project uh, process is uh, go goes very well and uh, the progress is much more than we expect expect 最後要跟各位報告的就是我們像淡江大橋這樣的一個工程其實在剛開始要實施的時候呃，因为环保的关系，受到民众的抗争
，但是透过廉政，哎，透过跟民众的座谈的沟通，呃，很多民众当初抗争的民众，呃，到现在都是几乎都是丹江大桥的环保的自工，好，就是把这个抗争，呃，从这个外力的困扰变成一个我们工程的助力。And another successful case is we the government want to be build a bridge, and the, but because you know the public construction will attract the labor neighbor, the neighbor people they will protect protest. So we use the integrity platform to uh re. Disclosure the information. Let the people know the bridge is uh fit with the 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 environment standard and the no harm to their environment. And uh, because such communication, let the people support the bridge construction. Now the people in the neighbor become the volunteer uh to protect. The construction project. 最后跟大家介绍，我们廉政平台在 YouTube 有一个六分钟的影片，里面其实介绍了很多我们廉政平台成功的案例。好，那欢迎大家去诶观赏，谢谢。那个案例有有有哦。And finally, we will introduce you to look at our YouTube video. That video will introduce the successful integrity platform, and uh, it only takes you six minutes, and uh, it will uh, it uh, the English available. So where can you see that video in the YouTube? Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Yao Zhong, for sharing so many uh, concrete examples of. What the platform has been doing, and uh, uh, one last question. This is truly the last question. This is, a, but also a tough question. If open country thing is such a win-win, why do governments still remain reluctant to adopt changes? How do we convince more countries to join? I think this is a question for Ben, and this is truly the last question. Thanks, Ike, and thank you for your indulgence. I will try to be quick. Um, so I think three things I want to say on this. Um, so firstly, I think that so we should also clarify a little bit what open contracting is. I think open contracting can give you win-win solutions, but they are winners and losers, right? So、uh, when you implement methodologies like open contracting, you will have winners in that you get you know better. Value for money or improve competition, reduce corruption, but there will be losers because those people who are behaving, for example, in a corrupt manner or doing things that they shouldn't be,、um, will lose and they should lose, right? So that's where we need to get to. So I think that's why, you know, in some in some instances, there is reluctance to implement open contracting because that's going to throw open and shine a light on some of the bad practices、um, that exist、uh, within public procurement processes. Um, there are also some technology and capacity issues、um, in some countries, you know, where、um, you know they might not have the resources to collect data or to develop the systems, the tools, the, the data analytics、um, to do this type of work. But fortunately, Taiwan is not.、Uh, In any of these two contexts, right? So I think that the the moment is an opportune one for Taiwan to lead by example, and I think that goes to the next question of how we convince more countries to join in. So currently, we have、um, over sixty countries who are actively、uh, publishing and using OCDS data and OC4IDS data. That's a lot already. So that's、uh, You know, governments,、uh, both national and subnational, all around the world. And I think what、uh, would be A great、um, encouragement for more countries to join would be if Taiwan were to spearhead this、um, this work, and particularly in the Asia、uh, Pacific region, and to show what can be achieved、uh, by this type of innovation and this type of you know、um, this type of open contracting approach. And I think that there are so many successes that we can glean、um, from and and synergies from the existing work in Taiwan. So I think that would be my call to action、uh, for Taiwan to lead by example and and spearhead the work and and show the what what fits within the realms of possibility. 
Okay. Thank you, Ben, for the call to action. I'm sure there's going to be a lot more dialogues or even collaboration between OGP, uh, OCP and ACC. I'm sorry, AAC, uh, Agency Against Corruption. Okay, too many. <laughs> okay. Uh, if you are, this is the, the last one. Uh, if you are interested in learning more about Taiwan's open government national action plans, you can just Google it or go to the National Development Council's web page or the fan page. Then you can know more about the details about these national action plans. Okay. Thank you all for joining this session and uh, hope you have a great evening or, or morning. Thank you all. Goodbye. Thank you. Cheers.